Good evening, everyone, and very good evening to an old friend in Dave Kellett, CYC <laughs> life member and past Commodore and put an amount of work in both on and off the water to make this club exactly what it is, a, a great ocean racing club. So we'll get to a lot of the detail a bit uh, further on, but Dave, good evening to you. And firstly, let's talk about the Hobart race, the three months to go. What are we feeling? Are we going to have a race or not? Well, I think probably um, it's a bit like last year. It's on until it's not. And I guess it's really up to Tasmania that if they're going to open the border for us, then we will get there. But if Tassie don't open the border, it's going to make it quite difficult. I think as the club has indicated that it will probably be that all crew will have to be fully vaxxed and uh, there maybe have to be some checks for health uh, one end or the other, but all that's to be determined, I guess. But yeah. fingers crossed we'll get it in this year. Yeah, well, we've got 85 entries already, which is great. And uh, 17 of those are two-handers. That's uh, interesting, isn't it? I mean, yeah, that is interesting. They were, um, that's a fifth of the fleet. So uh, last year was the first year, but of course the race wasn't held. But uh, there's a lot of interest in that shorthanded sailing. Well, it's massive in Europe, but we're seeing it drifting to Australia now, aren't we? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's the future. So we, it's, um, it's just going to grow and grow, I think. And uh, as you say, in Europe, it's just huge. So I'm yeah. sure it'll, it'll carry on here. Yeah. Now, off the water, your role, I think, this year is that you're the assistant race director for, for the Rolex Sydney Hobart race. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Lee Goddard is coming on as, uh, as the race director. Um, and uh, they've asked me to, to be his wingman. Uh, wow. So, uh, uh, which I'll... I'll enjoy doing. I, I was supposed to be race director last year, um, and uh, that didn't eventuate. So, but for, we'll... for those Dave that don't race to Hobart or don't race recently to Hobart or have never raced to Hobart, what, what is the role of the race director? Just just talk us through that. Well, he virtually controls the race. Um, it, the sailing committee uh, and the board conduct everything through the club um, up until a point where a team has to take over. So it's where the race committee take over and the race director is the chairman of that team and he calls the shots for the race. So he's, he has full responsibility for the race um, from several days out until the finish. So once the race is underway, then he's really directing traffic as it were. That's right, yeah. And um, over the last 20 years that I've been on the radio relay vessel, I've worked very closely with um, three race directors, uh, Chris Oxenbold and Tim Cox and Dave Jordan. Um, and it's a real team effort between us, um, coordinating everything and making sure that everyone's safe and that the race runs as smoothly as possible. And the notice of race and the sailing instructions, which are really the Bible for the race, are they part of the, the remit for the for the race director? Does he work hand in hand with the sailing committee or the organising authority? Yeah, exactly. He he works hand in hand with the, the sailing committee and the and the sailing office and uh, and the Sydney Hobart race committee. Right. Do the sponsor have any input at all in, into the into the race as far as conducting or running the race is concerned? No, we try and stay out of that side of it and leave that to the club management to, and uh, board to organise with the sponsor. But they, they don't have any involvement at all in the, in the actual conduct of the race. They're very involved, of course, with the, the presentations around the club, um, the village in Sydney and, in, and uh, down on Constitution Dock. And that's a very important part of their their coverage and uh, and of course the media, but we try and stay right away from that and just concentrate on on running the show with the with the yachts. Yeah, well, I think the club have been very lucky to have uh, have always had a very good sponsor, but certainly recent times Rolex have just been a wonderful sponsor for the club. Uh, a terrific organisation, and uh, during my time at World Sailing, I had a quite a 
uh, big involvement with Rolex. They were a sponsor of World Sailing. And very, very good people to deal with. And we're, the club is very, very lucky to have them. They sponsor some very prestigious sports and events, don't they? I see them in, you see them in tennis and golf and sailing throughout the, the world, you know, the fast net race and little sea race. They're, they're always there, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. All the top, all the top uh, sporting events you'll you'll see them involved. They really like a, a classy event. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the radio relay vessel. You mentioned you've the last 20 odd years you've been running that show. What, what's what's that like? Is that just a leisurely cruise to Hobart or put your feet up? Or? <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> so so just talk us through how when does preparation start for that? How, how does that all evolve for you? Well it, it starts several months before and um, we've been incredibly lucky over the the last 15 years that we've we've had the use of JBW by courtesy of John Winnie and his family and and Andrew Copley, the skipper of JBW. And Andrew and I worked very closely together to uh, determine what's required. And he always has the boat absolutely beautifully prepared and um, fully equipped. And um, so it, it starts several months out that we, we uh, work on the crew and all the equipment that we need and make sure it's all tickety-boo. Yeah. And you have your own radio relay team that, that goes aboard the JBW? Yeah, I've been very fortunate that um, I've had a, a team of guys that, well, they sailed with me for many years and then we've sort of stayed together as we've got a bit older and a bit more um, armchair bound. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we go down on the as a team on the on the radio relay boat. Uh, they've been great supporters of mine and uh, we, we work well as a team. And then Andrew has a, a very good team of, of guys that go down and run the boat um, for him and uh, run the watches, keeping her going. So we, we keep two independent teams. One's the boat team and one's the radio team. Yeah. And prior to the start, do the boats all have to check in via radio? Um, we require them to check in with Marine Rescue uh, prior to uh, several days prior to the event and get a sign off that their radio signals are right. And then on Boxing Day, we offer the service that we do a check for an hour or so. We're available for but just radio checks if uh, if they do, and probably 50 or 60% of the fleet check in with us on Boxing Morning to to make sure that everything's right. And then once the race gets underway, how many skeds a day, how many times do you contact the fleet? Oh, well, it's two now, but it used to be three. And uh, we have a couple of safety skeds in there that if it did become very bad weather, we could uh, instigate another safety sked if we needed to but normally it's just two skeds a day and of course now since the 98 race we have the the green cape check just south of eden that every yacht has to check in with us to make sure that everything's right on board and okay to proceed across bass Strait. and that would mean that their no, uh, their motors are, are are running and obviously their radios running if they're talking to you um, and, and the crew are in good order. What else? Uh, life rafts are intact, the, yeah. all the safety equipment, nothing's been washed overboard or lost, and the, the, the vessel's ready to go, fully found and ready to go across Bass Strait. And what about the two-handers? Have they got any extra um, requirements this year? Oh, the... Apart from their own qualification, no. They'll, um, they'll be just uh, uh, similar to a fully crewed but right. working a hell of a lot harder, I would have thought. Yeah, sure. sure, sure. <laughs> and, and Dave, what happens if, if a boat misses a sked and then misses two skeds? What, what, what happens then? Well, we have, a, we have a procedure in place where we, we um, have everybody in the fleet listening out or watching for those particular boats. Uh, I must say we've been very lucky in the in the last, well, certainly the last 15 years, we haven't had any 
any dramas. Um, with that, someone might miss a sked, but they're always there the next sked. So we haven't had to put any procedures into place. The the discipline in the with the radio work is fantastic in the in the fleet that we've got it in the Rolex Hobart race every year. It's um, it, it's developed to a very high level and everyone that participates is um, right on the ball with it. And and would it be a protestable situation if a boat uh, radioed in at Green Cape to say everything was working and then his radio for whatever reason went down? Is that something that a competitor could protest against? Uh, yeah, I think probably the race committee would um, take him to task first. Yeah. Um, he'd have to have a pretty good reason for that not to go to the protest room. Yeah, yeah. And, and all the boats, they've got uh, satellite telephones on board? Is that as a yes. backup? Yes, yep. Yeah. They satellite. do, and, and, and that's an area that's developing and we're moving towards using satellite phone communications, whether it be text or email. Or we're going to do some, uh, some testing on that in the next year to, to see where we're developing that and probably move away from HF over a number of years. So the, the boats are required a VHF, HF and a sat phone, is that? That's right. Yeah. 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 So there, there'd probably be no reason that they couldn't get in touch with someone, you wouldn't think, and if there's... No, a, well, that's it. Yeah. 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 When, and, when, when it was relying on just on the HF, you could get all sorts of absolutely. atmospheric problems. So yeah. the guys might miss a skid, but very rarely happens now. Yeah. And Dave, how long do you keep the skeds going? Till every boat's finished or do you hand over there to Hobart Radio? Well, we normally have get down to about two thirds of the fleet in and JBW will, will come in. And then we hand over to Hobart Race Control. The team down at the Royal Yacht Club have a very good radio set up and they conduct the skeds after we sign off. Right. Well, let's hope you can get on the water this year. I mean, everyone's hopeful, but uh, who knows? But anyway. Yeah, well, so fingers it's, crossed. It's on till it's off. That's that's what we like. Yeah. <laughs> so Dave, let's let's go back and talk about you a bit more. When when did you become first involved at the at the at the CYC? Oh. <laughs> uh, I grew up in, in Mossman. And I started my early sailing at Middle Harbour and I, I did my first Hobart race in 1968. I think you did yours on a very similar boat. We're on the old Carmen class. Yeah, you did. You were on the Cavalier, I was yeah. on the Calliope. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I sailed with Charlie Middleton out of Middle Harbour for a year or so. And uh, but because the racing was all through the CYC and being a young bloke, I liked to drink and uh, would go over to the CYC for a drink after the racing. And um, so I, I used to gravitate over there as well as Middle Harbour. And um, it just developed from there. And, and um, Boy Messenger took me under his wing, for better or for worse. <laughs> and uh, got me, uh, introduced me to Alan Payne and uh, I got involved in the training squad for the Gradle Two America's Cup Challenge, and quite a few of those guys were from ocean racing background. So uh, I just gravitated to the CYC and became a member in 1970. Right, right. But you, you, you know, you're young in your career sailing wise. I mean, you, you sailed on some pretty good boats. I mean, you mentioned the America's Cup with with Gradle, but in those early days, you. You sailed on uh, Bacardi, was it one of the boats you sailed on with Peter? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Cole, right. Peter, Peter Cole. Yeah. yeah, Peter Cole, that was his boat. Uh, yeah. And um, that was terrific in the 1970s. Uh, and then um, Big Bad John Gilliam bought uh, Kumalu, so I sailed on that <laughs> with uh, with Maxie Crawford and, and Greg Gilliam, a bloody good sailor. And uh, we had a terrific team on her. And then uh, Peter Hankin bought Bacardi and I sort of went with Bacardi to over to Pete Hankin and we had a great couple of years on her. 
So, uh, all out of the CYC. So, it was and very you, focused there. Eh? What are your memories of some of the, the characters then? I mean, we sort of <laughs> grew up in a similar era, but you just shake your head at some of the, the things that went on. But, you know, you look at blokes like Mickleborough and Cable and those, <laughs> those retrobates and Dickie was a, and Sandy it was Scott. Great, and, it, was, it was a great education for a yeah. young bloke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They were different times, weren't they? I mean, gee, those things those blokes got up to. Yeah, I think that's why my pancreas gave up and I had to quit alcohol <laughs> after, about, after about 15 years down there. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, there were some terrific characters around the club and um, I, I actually used to hang around the club in the, um, in the 60s. My, my grandparents lived up in Darling Point and... Uh, Every time we went to see my grandparents, I'd get my mum or dad to drop me at the CYC and I'd have a wander around the docks and drool over the boats and dream of having a ride in an ocean racer and then walk up to my grandparents' place and do the right thing. But, uh, yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, no, there were fantastic characters down there. Yeah. And Dave, um, I talk about another character that you were intimately involved with on both sides of things is with Bernard Lewis. Yeah. Um, now how, how did how did that all come about? Well, I, I was awfully lucky to fall in with Bernard um, because I'd had the experience sailing on on Gradle and Vim in the tune up for the Gradle Two America's Cup. Um, Bernard through, um, I think, a, a lot of alcohol, finished up buying Gradle from Jock, Jock Sturrock. And he had a team of guys from the squadron that were all mates who'd sailed on Jubilees, you know, the old Jubilees, the little lead mines. The, yeah. And uh, they didn't have much of an idea about sailing at a 12 metre. And uh, Curly Stalker was the paid hand on it. And he was struggling a bit with it. We bumped into each other in the bar and he asked me if I'd go out and have a sail. And uh, it went from there. Uh, the blokes that were Bernard's contacts on the boat asked me if I'd go and meet with him. And he asked me if I'd sail the boat and run the boat for him. So I had a great association with Bernard with the with the gradle and then um i actually went to work for him <laughs> but and, he, he, uh, just interrupting that but he wasn't a yachtsman was he, he as no such. no he, he actually <laughs> bought he bought gradle to promote his property development up on the gold coast uh, he developed a canal block up there a subdivision up there called huntington harbour and he thought that the Gradle being a, fan, a famous boat, that had attract some attention. Um, I hadn't quite worked out that the canals were about six feet deep and <laughs> Gradle was about nine foot six deep. So <laughs> they, they couldn't get her in up there. So he, and he had a waterfront home at, at um, Vaucluse and uh, they had her on a mooring there. So we he started sailing it and we developed her up over the years and. Uh, Took her to Hobart, actually got a, a second on handicap with her. Yeah. So, uh, behind New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. But just we'll stick with Gradle for the moment, the, the original America's Cup Challenger in 1962. I, I think I saw recently some photos. She's lying in disrepair somewhere in Europe. Is that? Is yeah. That oh, it's, a, it's an absolute tragedy. <laughs> um, Doug Peterson, the, the designer, the yacht designer bought her and was going to restore her. So he took it to Europe and she wasn't too bad. Then you could still sail her, um, but it just fell into disrepair. And then a, a boat building company in Germany purchased her. And she's been sitting in their yard, just out in the open, falling apart. It's tragic to see her. Yeah, uh, there was a, a group of us tried to get together a few years ago to to get some interest to um, buy it and restore her, but it 
didn't eventuate. Yeah. We we we, we lack that uh, that boat building commodity called sea ash. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Rather important around boats. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. But did you you went to uh, the America's Cup in seventy seven with Great Hall two with Wingnut Gordon Ingate, didn't you? Yes, well, um, I um, I did the the World One Ton Cup on an American boat in nineteen seventy two at the CYC and fell in love with an American girl and went back to America. Yeah, and um, we were living over there, and Gordon contacted me and said we're. I bought Gradle too, and we're bringing her over for the America's Cup. Can you get me some dockage and housing and so forth? So uh, I uh, I did some research and went down to Newport for him because I lived in Marblehead, a couple of hours away. And uh, George Carmony, who worked for American Express at the time, was another contact of um, of Gordon's, and he and I worked together to. Uh, get dockage and housing and all the things that you need for an America's Cup team in uh, in Newport for 1977. So yeah. that was a wonderful experience as well. Well, talking about characters, there's, there's a character and a half, Gordon. Gordon? Oh, fabulous yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, I did a bit of sailing on the caprice with him and, uh, yeah, he's a larger-than-life character. He's got a marvellous record when you look at his sailing. Oh, from his, just is he incredible not, sailing. Not, he, he must be 92 or three, is he? I, Something like that. Yeah, and he's still out there and still sailing yeah. with great, great skill. It, it's a remarkable story. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. guy. And, and, well, we'll get back to Bernard. Then after Great, he purchased... Um, You've gone on mute. Pete. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> he purchased Siska from Rolly Tasker. Is that... To become vengeance? Yes, that's yeah. right. We, um, he was looking around for a boat that would go a bit better than the Gradle. She was starting to get a bit tired of ocean racing and we didn't want to hurt her too much. And um, so he, we did a deal with Rolly Tasker and, and purchased Cisco 4 and uh, Bernard christened a vengeance and we had some success with her for a few years. Uh, took line honours in 1981 and uh, and um, finished in the top four or five for the next few years with her. Took line honours in quite a few of the East Coast races. Uh, well, it's interesting, a guy that, you know, wasn't a yachty, but, you know, he obviously liked the sport that, you know, he put so much into it, didn't he? Oh, look, he, he, really, he really enjoyed it and... Uh, Whilst he didn't, he wasn't actually a sailor. He was out there with us a lot and sailed a, a lot on the Gradle and then um, then on the Vengeance as well. He did the Hobart race that we took line on us. Oh, he did. He did the race, did he? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. and uh, and then he he really enjoyed that. But he he um, he enjoyed the camaraderie. Yeah. Really enjoyed the uh, the CYC. Uh, <laughs> we had the uh, Apray he, drinks. We were <laughs> he, and, he and Cable could dribble together. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about the world's greatest port runner winch hand. <laughs> That's right. But but then he took the massive step of deciding to to get a maxi yacht built here in Australia. Yeah, that was a massive project that oh. you ran the whole thing. At, just incredible, and that, and that was a it was a, a great honour that that he gave me to um, to manage that project and put together and and uh, yeah, it was it was a, a fabulous time of my life. Um, yeah, yeah. But to to do that, I mean, it's um, I guess like blokes that own horses, they they never ride them, but they just watch them. Go around the track and win. Hopefully, I mean, it's, yeah. Well, there was a bit of that in it. He, yeah. he enjoyed that. He enjoyed he enjoyed having the, um, the the challenge and and the project. Uh, we'd we'd go through the project together and decide on where we were going and how we were doing it. He really enjoyed that part of it yeah. as well. Yeah. And of course, yeah. that was a 
a fantastic project to to help design and build and yeah sale it was uh, yeah i mean to, to put your heart and soul into that and then unfortunately your first hobart um you had to retire with mast issues but it all came together for the 1987 race for you yeah oh 87 was just incredible i think yeah uh, I don't think we missed a line on us, and um, we won many, many races on handicap as well. So, yeah, that was, a, that was quite a year. And of course, the crowning glory winning the, the double in the Hobart race. Was yeah, that was, uh, yeah. yeah, it's still the, the dream team from Sovereign. We're dreaming yeah. of another win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but then, then, he took the, then you took the boat to the States. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think at one stage, the uh, Jim Kilroy and all those guys were out in Australia and Bernard thought we were pretty good with um, with Vengeance, but we weren't next to them. So that was a challenge. So he thought, well, we'll take that on. And we'll, I think we got, we got into the um, team for Hawaii and it went from there. Then we, we didn't do too badly there but weren't weren't right on the money so we went over to um, san francisco to keep going on it and then went on the world maxi circuit yeah finished up winning quite a few of them we tweaked the boat yeah and uh, and, and where did where did sovereign end up Dave? uh we sold it to an american and it's amazing that uh we we built her in australia campaigned her and then an American came along and paid us more money than it cost us to build it. <laughs> so we, Bernard being a businessman, he said, well, we've done what we want to do with it. Yeah. That's, a, that's a bloody good offer. <laughs> Let's take it. Yeah. You don't often, uh, you don't often get out of a boat like that for uh, what it's cost you. So uh, we sold it to an American and it went to, San Diego and was there for a number of years. Is it still around? Do you hear of it at all? She was eventually sold to um, uh, to Europe, and I last heard she was in Croatia. She wow. being a big aluminium boat, and it was designed so that there were no bulkheads in it. The bulkheads were fairly. Uh, small so it was a terrific layout to be able to put a good cruising interior in right. and uh, i think someone put a cruising interior in and put a doghouse on it it was quite a handsome looking boat yeah, it i was. saw a photo of it many years right. ago yeah. no, lovely lovely profile boat. yeah yeah no she's a great boat yeah but dave while you're putting all this massive time in on the water you you started to put a massive time in off the water with the club. I mean, you, you rose up through the ranks and what was the driving force behind that? <laughs> well, in when I first started sailing bigger boats, I sailed with Horry Godden on Kalina. And the Horry at that stage was president of Yachting New South Wales and chairman of the, of the, of the offshore committee, I guess it was, or the offshore safety committee. And I understood what he was doing. And then I saw with Charlie Middleton and Charlie Middleton was the Australian representative of what was the International Yacht Racing Union then. So I understood what he was doing. And between the two of them, they instilled in me that you had to put back into the sport. And uh, I wasn't I wasn't in a position where I had the wealth to buy a boat. So I thought, well, the best thing I can do is, is try and help the sport. So I started doing things around the CYC. And of course, our, our great mate, Gordon Marshall, was the, the one that really put the finger on me because we were, we were doing short races out of Sydney as usual on a Saturday and they were having a bit of trouble with the marks drifting. And I, I got a bit frustrated one day and I wrote a letter <laughs> complaining about the marks drifting. <laughs> That's the worst thing you've ever done. Yeah. Next thing Gordon was on the phone to me 
He said, we don't appreciate letters like that. <laughs> we be at the Yacht Club at six o'clock on Thursday. And I thought I was getting carpeted by the board or something. So I walked into the little old sailing office in those days where we used to have the meetings. Yeah. And uh, Gordon was there and a few others there. And he said, oh, you, sit down there. <laughs> he said, you're, you're so bloody smart, you can help us run this place. So, <laughs> so I joined the sailing committee. That was, that was Gordon being very pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a terrific bloke, Gordon. He I learned was. a lot from him. He was. And uh, very, very, very enthusiastic guy and very knowledgeable. Great guy. Yeah, yeah he, he was. And uh, talk about blokes have done a lot for this, oh. for our club. He was yeah. remarkable. Remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, you obviously, <laughs> things happen and you ended up top. Well, post as Commodore. How yeah, that? well, it, that was, it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was very lucky and um, going through the ranks and, and uh, also at the same time, because I was on the sailing committee and an ocean racer, they asked me if I'd go and represent the club at Yachting New South Wales and I finished up becoming chairman of the offshore committee for New South Wales and then that led to the Australian Offshore Committee of, of Australian Sailing, or as it is now, Australian Sailing. So I, I finished up becoming chairman of the Offshore Committee for Australia. And then that led me to um, representing Australia at the Offshore Racing Council over in, uh, in England. Uh, it just sort of snowball. <laughs> you had a lot of hats on, but I, I just want to stay with the CYC for the moment. How did you find Commodore? Was it was it was it difficult? I mean, I mean, um, you probably had to be a step above your your mates or whatever, just because you were the Commodore. Did, did that fit easily with you, or did you did you find that a bit of a grind? No, I, I sort of it came fairly easily to me, I guess. I, I just. I like being a leader. Yeah. Um, so I, we had a good team and we just went along with it. And, yeah. and of course, you'd had several years working on committee. And yeah. Um, I guess from the time I first started on the sailing committee to, uh, to becoming Commodore was uh, 10 or 11 years. Uh, so you, you get pretty well blooded on the way through. So you went in with your eyes firmly open. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I enjoyed, I, I loved the time and, and helping the club. I just yeah. got a real kick out of that. And Bernard was very supportive as well because uh, I was working for him at the time as well as sailing his boat. And um, he said, look, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in something like that. And he said, we need to, as a team, we need to put back in. So I'm happy to support you to do it. So I was very lucky that I... Yeah. I had his support to spend the time and and the effort to do it. Well, a wonderful attitude from from you both, obviously. But I'll, I'll take you across the world now to, to world sailing, or what was it called previously? Was it? Well, it was the International Yacht Racing. That's right, IYA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then it became the International Sailing Federation, right. which was well, that's, ISAF. That's had, a, that's had a bit of a checkered career, hasn't it? Oh. Yeah, but you, it's a you, shame. you were treasurer of that. Where did you treasure? Well, I, yeah, I, I started um, started as the Australian representative for it, and was the Aussie rep for a number of years. And then I was asked if I would stand as a vice president, and I stood for vice president. And there were a number of terms that you could do and they were four-year terms but halfway through they changed the the term so I finished up being a vice president for 10 years and um, I was pretty pleased with what we were able to achieve for Australia we had a lot of international events and and of course we got the Olympic Games through all that so we 
we'd managed that well. And, uh, but then at the end of that term, I, I had to stand for president or move along. And then uh, a very dear friend of mine, Yoren Pedersen, who had been a vice president for the same length of time, um, he had indicated that he would run for president and being a European and the world sailing's European centric. So uh, he, uh, he was going to get elected over me, I felt. So I was happy to, he asked me if I'd be his treasurer. And that gave me another four years on the executive board of world sailing. So I finished up doing 14 years and, and then, um, the brash young bloke from Australia decided that he'd stand to be president of World Sailing. So that was an interesting <laughs> tilt. <laughs> but geez, you, you would be able to tell some stories 14 years with World Sailing. I mean, there must have been a lot of politics played out in that arena. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's all politics. It's, uh, you know, quite a, an eye opener. And, uh, as, as you would know, and many members of the CYC know, I'm a pretty open guy, and uh, what you see is what you get. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't that good at playing politics. Well, but um, the yeah, well, that's that's a. But I, I had some wonderful opportunities through yeah. there, and um, in um, w particularly with the Olympic Games. Um, I was, uh, even though I was an offshore person, I, I guess they saw the leadership qualities and uh, Paul Henderson and I, who Paul was president at the time, and he asked me if I'd be his representative in Sydney um, to manage or help manage the, um, the world sailing side of the Olympics in Sydney. And then I went on to be um, part of the, the technical delegate team in, in Athens. And then I was the technical delegate for Beijing and for London. So um, they were four Olympic regattas that I was very instrumental in organising and managing. So, so a, how much well, input does World Sailing have with the games, Dave? Well, they run the they run run the actual Olympic regatta. So all the sailing is controlled by World Sailing and their um judges umpires and and race officials right okay right. Right. Gee, you must have done some got some frequent fly miles up. Oh. <laughs> yeah and <laughs> at the height of it i was uh, i was doing between five and six trips to europe each year right so uh, yeah good old zoom would have stopped that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, the gravy train. <laughs> the junkets, yeah, the junkets. The yeah. junkets, yeah, yeah. The junkets, that'd be right. Uh, how are <laughs> <'Cause> we... <laughs> I'd hate to think what it cost me over the years. <laughs> how are we represented now on World Sailing? Australia got representation. Oh, yeah, my word. Um, we have, um, at the moment, Sarah Kenny uh, from Australia is a vice president and uh, she's a a past vice president of Australian sailing, terrific person and very knowledgeable. And they're trying to salvage world sailing at the moment to get it back on an even keel. Yeah. Cause they, they ran into a few financial issues, didn't they? Weren't yeah. They? Yeah. No, it's, it's in pretty poor shape. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and what about the selection of Olympic classes, is that worked in with the International Olympic Committee and World Sailing or no, the, overriding? Yeah, World, World Sailing select the classes, but there, there's an input from the International Olympic Committee as to what the, what the types of uh, competition should be. And then the World Sailing fit the, fit the equipment to it. Right. So, the to it. so you'd assume that there's someone on the International Olympic Committee that knows something about sailing. Yeah, there's quite a few sailors in there. 
um, that um, and then the World Sailing have a have a good rapport with the the sports department at the IOC, and they they're talking regularly to them, the staff levels. I mean, well, World Jack Sailing Rob, staff. Jack Rob, who passed away recently, he was the boss of um, International Olympic Committee. He was a Olympic. Yachtsman for the fin. Yeah, company. he was a fin. He was a yeah. fin sailor, and um, I was on a couple of committees in my early days with Jacques. He was a very nice man, yeah. and uh, very knowledgeable. But, um, he, um, yeah, having people like that in there, and uh, Ning Sum Yang from Singapore is is currently on on the executive. He's yeah. a sailor. I, Sat next to him for a few years. He represented Singapore, and I represented Australia right. uh, on the on the World Sailing Council at the time, and we became close friends. So, how did the uh, the two handed event that was going to be promoted for the Paris Games? How did that fall over? And it looked as though that was home and hosed. This um, double handed event that was going to be raced out of Marseille for the Paris Olympics that that looked a as I say, it looked to be all about there, but it, it never got there. What happened there? Do you know? Not really. I think it was just something a bit too different from the norm. Uh, I think you'd, you'd probably have to ask Matt Allen that. Yeah. He was very heavily involved, but yeah. it it's a shame. Yeah, well, it could he, have been he, a great event. But, well, he was uh, very excited about it, Matt, of course, because he was a, a, a real driving force in it. Yeah, he, he certainly like, was. He did a great job. It, look, it's, it was saying politics is involved, and that certainly is where it comes in. That if um, Europe has the majority of the votes, and if they don't want it, it's not going to happen. So you've really got to do you get your numbers right. And uh, I thought they had, but uh, yeah, it was. I think it was just too too far out of the norm yeah. for them. It would have given it, as Matt was saying, it would have given them 24-hour coverage. Oh, it would have been fantastic for yeah. sailing. Yeah. And, and for the IOC, it would have given them something to look at in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, maybe for... Yeah, I hope they keep trying. A few years. Well, it won't be in for Paris, but it's certainly been for... What's well, LA after Paris, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I know Matt will, will drive that because... Oh, I'm he, sure he will. He's the... Yeah. Yeah. He's the chairman of the World Sailing Offshore Committee now, so. Yeah. And and America's Cup, Dave, um, what's the World Sailing involvement there? Oh, very little. Is it? Yeah. Um, we, back when I was on the executive, we had a um, an arrangement where they would use all of the ISAF race officials and we had a very good relationship and uh, and they paid a uh, a big fee which helped educate race officials and was put into junior sailing development um but that seems to have dropped away now and I, and i guess it's probably the the way the world's going with this modern technology that they've got now it's just fantastic the way they the way they um adjudicate on the America's Cup racing, all done through uh, computers and cameras and so forth. It's, it's uh, a real development. Can events step outside the, the realm of world sailing and just do their own thing? Or is that a no-no? No, it's a no-no. The, um, the, you, you've got to be within the, within the family. And, right. and, and then you get you get qualified to do that. Um, I, I guess you know a rogue group could set something up, but you you'd be banned from sailing in other competitions, right? If you did so, like, um, like Sail GP that we've got coming to Sydney in December, um, and the America's Cup, they would all form under the the umbrella of, of world sailing in some shape or form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they used to be very heavily or you know, re really well coordinated with them. I'm not yeah. sure where they are now. Sort of lost track of that a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, Dave, last year you were um, made a life member of uh, Sailing Australia. That's a great feather in your cap. Oh, they've, they've been that. very kind to me. I've uh, I've had some lovely awards from from the various organisations. Uh, I I think it means I've been around for a while and well, take I, I this and go. But I think it means more than that. There's a lot of people who've been around for a while, but I mean, yeah. I mean, your input off the water has been remarkable i think it um and your, your whole family really your wife kendy who's a life member of the cyc she's put in a remarkable effort and your son oh, Brad, who's oh, a, i was so lucky and and that's the that's really the secret I, yeah. I couldn't do it without the support of the family and kendy has been with me all the way yeah on all of those various uh projects that i've had and um involvement in the various committees and hasn't um complain too much about the time I've put in. <laughs> well, also, I'll just say, Brad, your son, yeah. the shotsman, he's done very well. He's now on the board of the CYC. And yeah, the very, job he's very proud done. of him. He's, uh, yeah. as, I, as I often say, I, I used to be uh, known as a famous yachtsman. Now I'm Brad Kellett's dad. Yeah. So. <laughs> But I see he's going to Hobart. Info track has been renamed. I see. Yeah, Law Connect. Right. It's called okay. now. So, okay, well, yeah, well, that's that's the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. So uh, now, very proud of Brad. He's done yeah. a great job, and uh, he's uh, he's putting in, and uh, his wife Tori and uh, our daughter Jennifer. Well, they're all members of the club, and yeah, we that. spend a lot of time down there, and love well, the place. All he's got to do is read the sailing instructions carefully because sometimes he gets them a little bit mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I was very pleased I wasn't sailing with him that day. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll keep that off the air for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep reminding him of a, a very <laughs> big mistake he made not so long ago. So, Dave, where, where you are look we? Good, though. <laughs> yes. Where are we at with the boats these days? What do you, what do you think of the modern ocean racer? Oh. Ah, uh, look, I, I guess it's the way of the world. Everything develops that way. But I think um, now as I, um, as I get off Sydney after a Saturday afternoon sailing and hobble down the dock, I'm pretty <laughs> pleased I'm not sitting on the back of a TP-52 bouncing around the yeah. ocean. <laughs> or, a, or, a, or a Carmen class trying to get to Hobart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. So well, five, five, five knots everywhere. <laughs> yes. I On a good day. <laughs> you've been a, a wonderful contributor to the club and Australian sailing, the world sailing. So it's an absolute credit to you and your family, everything you've done. I think you've really made the club what it is today. And I think uh, the recognition you've received has been very, very well deserved. And um, I know you're going to keep going. You're on a various committees down at the club and you're running the radio relay vessel and you're assistant race director. So long may it continue. I'm sure you'll continue to get the support from your wonderful family. So congratulations. Thanks for tonight. Um, and uh, oh, pleasure, Pete. It's, um, it, it's been a wonderful journey and I've made so many wonderful friends yeah. uh, around the CYC and uh, everywhere else that we've sailed and overseas it's uh it's terrific and uh i've been so lucky and had such loyal crew members that have sailed with me over the years and all those old maxis we used to thump around on and it's just been a, a terrific journey i've been very lucky well we've just got time for one quick question it's from someone anonymous i think that's how you say it favorite sailing location and favourite sailing yacht. There you go. Oh, well, I guess Sydney Harbour is pretty good. Yeah. But I, I love the, I love the Sydney Hobart race. I, I think that's just fabulous. It can be kind to you sometimes. It can be a bloody awful other times. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, you'd have to go with Sovereign. She yeah. was just very special to me and having to. Um, as I said earlier, to help with the design and layout of it, and the construction, and then skippering her and taking the double—that was uh, yeah. that was absolutely special. 
Yeah, wonderful. All right, well, we'll uh, time for dinner. Um, thanks, Dave, and Kendi in the background. As I said, been fantastic, Dave. You've been an absolute ornament to the club and to sport in general. So yeah. long may I continue, and um, hopefully we'll see you soon down at the yeah. golf. Thank club. Thanks, Pete. I, I should say that I, I've been very lucky with a range of owners that I've sailed with, and. Um, you know, the association that I've had with them has been absolutely wonderful. And I, we're still sailing today on, on Sydney. I've been sailing with Charles Curran on that for 25 years. Yeah. And it's been a wonderful relationship. And before that, uh, Bernard Lewis, you said, as you said, but there's been other owners that I've sailed with them. They've all been so supportive and uh, it's just been a wonderful journey. Yeah. Very lucky. All crew members could uh, echo those thoughts. I think we've all been very fortunate to have been involved with some terrific owners who have done so much for the sport. But well done, Dave. Um, see you soon. Stay well. And Thanks, Pete. Keep at it. Good on you. Good, Good on, on you, mate. Good night, all. <laughs>